All right, so maybe there's a new greeting that's out there or needs to be out there, introduced and innovated by the head coach of the Arizona Cardinals, Jonathan Gannon, who earlier this week looked at Darren and essentially said, hey, uh, D, how, how's your plasma? I, I don't think that's exactly what happened, but... I mean, there's how's life, there's how's it going, how you doing, and then there's how's your plasma? I didn't know that's... Is that something that the NFL monitors as part of the athlete training programs and all the biometrics and whatever else? Because, Darren, when he posed the question that the big heat of AZ, and we're getting to the point where it's big, big heat... Uh, it actually is beneficial to a human's plasma. Yeah, he did say that. Okay. Now, because we were all behind you, because you always command a front row seat right next to Danny Sarek, and here we are on Cardinals Underground, brought to you by Pacific Office Automation Poly Podcast, uh, we couldn't tell if you made a face like you were in the know or you were finding out at that moment. Uh So do reveal. It was definitely a finding out look. Okay. And Jonathan Gannon clearly was looking at me when – I made the face, which was probably a mistake, and he he noted it. Although I will say this, yeah. A, I didn't know that. So yeah. props to Jonathan Gannon for letting me know something I didn't know. Okay. And then also, uh, while Danny and I appreciate the the fact you note that we're in the front, I, I don't think anybody's ever stopped you from being in the front. <laughs> just uh, you're just one of those guys that sits in the back like Grealu. Oh wow. Okay. Nice and quiet back there. That hurts. I mean, it's one thing, you know, but now that you're grouping me with Grealu, that's that, that, that's so close well, to Grealu, being fighting words right we, there. We just came from a thing where all of us were in with a presentation with the rookie class, and yeah. Grealu was going to sit in the back of the room until I told him to get his butt forward. <laughs> It's good. Okay. All right. Um, Danny, how tough is it to, to command? If I had that ambition to get a front row seat, what would it take on a press conference by press conference basis? Confidence? I, getting there early enough? That's that's one of the main things, Paul, getting is getting there, there early, early enough. enough. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of deal breakers. Let me tell breakers. you something for those yeah. of you who don't have the pleasure of being in press conferences. <laughs> if the starting time is one time, that's not the actual starting time. You actually need to expect it to start five minutes early, which means you need yep. to be there at least five minutes before that, which means you're really getting there 15 latest 10 minutes before it's actually scheduled to start. Facts, as the kids would say. By the way, speaking of plasma and uh, innovative new thinking, I saw this. You guys realize that there's a new generation of smart bandages that could allow doctors to remotely monitor wounds, decrease scarring, and speed up healing with a zap of light or electricity. And that they're working on smart bandages, and supposedly it's not that far away from being reality. That Are sounds... you in- investing in this on Bitcoin? Yeah. Is that how that works? <laughs> <That's> good. <laughs> There's a new Ethereum ETF coming out, Danny. We'll talk about that later. I know you can't wait. I was going to say the same thing. Look, how far are we from the Olympics? Because if breakdancing, as I also just found out, can be an Olympic sport. Wait, what? Breakdancing is an Olympic sport, just to let you know. I was not aware of this. There will be gold, silver, and bronze in breakdancing. Who do you think would be gold, silver, bronze breakdancing between the three of us? Oh, Jesus. (laughs) I guarantee you, you're gold. (laughs) Yeah. I'm always gold. And then I'm always between the two of us, there would, there we, would be, we might be we might be voted off the podium, and there's nobody else to replace yeah. us. They, they, they will have conveniently lost <laughs> the silver and bronze medal and just awarded the gold. Is what would have happened. They would have found a, a way. I don't even like. They would have found a way to. Uh, I think you just created some nightmare fuel. Yeah, thinking of us break dancing. Yeah, like I can kind of see you. I, I mean, look. I used you, to dance. Did you really? Yeah, I used to dance. Did you ever break dance? Not break dance. I would do like hip hop and stuff like that. Oh, but yeah, I never I could did totally break dancing. See that. I could totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. I mean, I don't. I haven't done that in a very long time. I'm not here saying that I could. That's okay. Bust out some moves. I'm. But... I'm picturing that you could bust out some like, moves, especially compared like to. Like you would do it in the clubs, or you would like take classes and you, as like a youngster. To, yeah, I used to like take classes and like <laughs> dance. Yeah. Nothing says suburbia like the you know is there. Third grader taking break dancing classes or whatever, no, right? I didn't do Hip-hop, break dancing. Whatever. Break dancing. Yeah. Like, she's There's too young for break dancing. There's That's part of the thing. <laughs> Throw down the cardboard and let's go. All right. So I'm trying to figure out a segue, a uh, little help. Uh, yeah, we've maybe, gotten totally lost here. Yeah, That's se- what happens in June. Actually, the segue I need is this the mean the mean mug I'm getting from the studio to move it along, Cal VC. So uh, speaking of JG, um, 
If he was to take role and attendance at the OTAs, final week of the OTAs leading into the mandatory minicamp next week, uh, we saw Kelvin Beecham out there. So I think that makes 90, does it not? Or is it 91 with Bernhard Sykovitz? I believe it's 91 with Psycho. Okay. But yeah, he, Gannon said that everybody's here. Or but everybody. Be- Beecham does that every year. Yeah, that's he does. not that's nothing to read in between. He's always doing his own thing and shows up kind of at the end of voluntary workouts and is always here for mandatory stuff. Right. I mean, also he, true. He, he's on board of directors. You know, <laughs> he's going to be a future CEO. He's probably got a campaign going for governor of Texas at this point. You know, he's a busy guy. I remember seeing him at Fitz's uh, supper club <laughs> event. <laughs> Fitz reveres. Kelvin Beecham, by the yes, way. Yes, he does. He really does. And I think, honestly, I think part of the reason is what you were just talking about. He loves how smart <laughs> Beecham is in the business world because that's what Fitz yeah. is all about, especially yeah. these days. Yeah. I mean, Danny, if Kelvin Beecham was an ETF, we'd invest. Put it that way. So, all right, there's that. What's and e- okay. What's, what's an ETF? And then... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> there, there was also, uh, I have to say, you know... Uh, There was also on easycardinals.com an in-depth feature piece on Xavier Thomas. I thought was uh, very, speaking of the rookies who who we'd had a chance to speak with, uh, and then there was a screen grab up on the, uh, screenshot up on the, for presentation purposes, and it was of the feature story. What kind of feedback did you get on that, Darren? And for those who uh, haven't checked it out, but will, I mean, what will you tell folks about what to expect? Well, feedback, I mean, not a ton, I'll be honest. Uh, you did say it was a good story. I was, oh, yeah. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate no, I, that. I just love his story. Here you go. He was the uh, round five pick, number 138 overall. After his third year at Clemson, he was thought to be a first-round pick. He was supposed to be, you know, three-and-done kind of guy. He's a freshman All-American at Clemson. He's on the same D-line with Christian Wilkins and Dexter Lawrence. And, I mean, all these future first-rounders. He had the third fastest combine in his 40 at his combine for his position. Uh, the only guys were like Jared Verse and Chop Robinson were ahead of him, two first rounders. So I'm just intrigued by the potential, what he was, and then his last few years at Clemson, which were marred by injury, and then him stepping away from the game for a time and the difficult time he had with the pandemic. And I'm just, if there's a guy I'm pulling for in this draft class, it's Xavier Thomas. I, for sure, with me. I mean, I, I not only pulling him because I love his story, but I, you love what it could be. Yes, it's funny when, especially round five. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's funny when he first showed up, and and I noticed this too. I didn't say it anywhere, but then I tw- I had happened to tweet out a picture of him in his uh, initial press conference, and somebody said what I was already thinking was you get a little bit of Darnell Dockett vibes with the look. And I agreed with that. And I will say, and I even told Xavier this when I was talking to him for the story. I'm like, you, there, there are, a, you might have to work a little bit, but there's some parallels there. I mean, Darnell Dockett was a third round pick that could have been a first round pick. Now he dropped because people thought he might be a little, have a screw loose. And, and in fact, he had enough of one to be a great football player, but it wasn't so crazy. But he ended up dropping to the third round and being available. And, and if, you know, Xavier Thomas is a totally different person, um, and but he still thinks even and he's a, I think he's a pretty humble guy and he understands. First of all, he said he knows that now it actually worked out that he went through depression and didn't come out until after actually six years of college football. He said if he had come out three after three years like he had planned all along, if the pandemic hadn't happened, that he would have washed out in the league in two years because he point. wasn't wasn't yep. mature enough. Um, if he's the, he's still right. He still thinks he could have been a first round pick. And I'll tell you, if you get a, if you get anything that is close to a first round pick in the fifth round, like that would be amazing. And it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this whole outside linebacker crew sorts itself out. Cause there's a lot of bodies there to have the wherewithal, especially at a young age of seeing the positives in your journey I know that Thomas made a comment to you, Darren, about how he was surrounding himself with yes men and, and took a lot look at that and, and his inner circle. And to have the self-awareness, to have the confidence in yourself to persevere through all of that, to have the maturity speaks volumes of him as a person and tells me that he has the mental strength and capacity and drive to push himself and also be successful out on the field. 
Yeah, to your point, he had the wherewithal to realize that now in hindsight that by his third year at Clemson, as D.J. Humphreys used to say, he was smelling himself, right? There he was. He came out of high school, top three high school recruits in the country. Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, Xavier Thomas, Micah Parsons was fifth. He's still close with Micah Parsons. <laughs> Micah Parsons has been a two-time All-Pro. So here he is entering the league at this point. He still likes to think of himself as competing with a Micah Parsons. So to your point, Darren, if in round five you get a guy with that sort of get off, that sort of speed off the edge, that sort of first step, which supposedly he still has, and you're able to develop that as a coaching staff. I mean, he has things you can't teach that you normally draft in round one. I just think it's really compelling as a prospect, as a player. I mean, we're going to get around to training camp and there's going to be the first day of full contact, full pads. He's going to be one of the first guys I know I'm going to train my eyes on, Xavier Thomas. Well, so. And again, you've got a position that really doesn't have anybody who is grabbing you and saying, this is that guy, or two of them. I mean, now they're going to rotate anyways, but there's opportunity for whoever might take it, whether it's him, whether it's B.J. Ojolari, whoever it might be. By the way, we already gave B.J. Ojolari the Rex Ryan Award for winning the offseason. The famous now infamous claim by the then Buffalo Bills head coach that we've won the offseason. I think we won the offseason. Then he won three games and got fired. So in honor of that comment, we always give the uh, hardware I'm, out. I'm really glad that was the Rex or, Ryan or comment that you chose. <laughs> winning the offseason. So Danny knows where thought. I was going. Thought go, process. Oh boy, yeah. let me be aware of my facial reaction because we've got cameras <laughs> no. in here. You guys had a front row seat at the aforementioned press conference. There was B. Joe Gilari. Did he or did he not put on some muscle mass? Yeah, he, he definitely looked like he was going in the second year. I mean, he, he's went in the offseason in the weight room. And he said he got up around 260 and now he's high 250s. He played last year in the high 240s. He was still rehabbing last offseason. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like he true. wasn't even. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he, he put on put on some weight, some yeah. muscle. So I don't know whether to be concerned that they're trying to change his stride or not. Not sure I've ever heard that before. Well, that was an interesting topic that Gannon brought up when he talked to the media was when asked about Ojolari and, and the goals for this offseason and putting on weight, getting a little bigger was one of them and working on his technique. And when it came to the stride, Gannon had said that Ojolari's natural stride is a little too long. And the reason it's in their eyes too long is to prevent a hamstring injury and that players who have a stride that long when you look at the numbers, tend to be more susceptible to a certain type of hamstring injury. So that that says, okay, we've got a player who's coming off, you know, coming out of his college career where last offseason was rehabbing some injuries. I believe a hamstring, it was a hamstring and a knee that he was dealing with, I believe. So that's being preventative in that sense and, and protecting him and his body for the long haul. I, 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 I kind of agree with Paul, but I under, you know, it's like what you were just saying. Like When they start explaining like it could stop, not stop, but like make the hamstring injuries maybe less prevalent, I thought that was really interesting. And I, I think it also goes back to a lot of what they're doing now in terms of the sports science and measuring how these guys – because along those same lines, Gannon talking about how Harrison, Marvin Harrison may be working too hard, and it's not necessarily because you don't want him to work, but like – They've got all the. I th was I was thinking about this when Gannon was talking about it. It's like Marvin Harrison wants to go off on the weekend and do extra work, and he's like, "What he didn't say, but what I what I kept thinking he wanted to say about that was, dude, we are like we're we're putting all this time and effort into measuring how much you run around and do all this stuff, and then you're going to do all this extra stuff and blow it all yeah. out of the water. Yeah. And and to me, that's the same thing as like the stride thing is like we're really we've distilled all this data down to like how hopefully. Not only that Marvin Harrison is still going strong in Week 17, but that B. Joe Ojolari, perhaps, which is crazy to me, to be honest, smart Band-Aid-ish, esque a little bit, that you actually could figure out something to change how he plays to prevent that injury, which I would think would be almost impossible to like know exactly how that would work. And hence, that's my concern, or my question whether we should be concerned. Is it realistic to think that an NFL player – at this point in their athletic career, can change their stride. Is it akin to 
Tim Tebow I brought up earlier, changing his throwing motion, trying to shorten the throwing motion. Now, that proved impossible for him. Some quarterbacks, a few, have done it and been successful. But in the pressure of the moment, and you're competing against a 300-pounder, aren't you going to resort to what you've known all your life? Not the same. Kyler Murray changed his footwork in the middle of last season. Good point. Which, yeah. which foot he yeah. was leaning off with. Left that's foot what this, forward. Right, and, and timing the routes with his ding, receivers. Ding, ding. That's a great point. And and look, if he can master that, not only does it help him prevent future hamstring injuries, but to hear the coaches talk about it, it makes him more stout at the point of attack because he's chopping his feet more, he's getting his feet in the ground, his base is strong, he doesn't have the long strides, or maybe he's caught off stride by an offensive lineman. He can set the edge play against the run, which was the lone knock on B.J. Ojolari coming out of LSU. He's also early in his career. Yeah. I mean, this is the point. If you want to kind of – tweak things around and see what works this is this is the time in his career time in the year in the offseason to to see if that's feasible and and I would I would also say and I understand the point of how difficult it might be but I don't know if 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 changing how far you stride would be that much different than again you were talking about Kyler's footwork or having Paris Johnson move to the left side or I mean I think that kind of falls all falls in the same bucket, and to me, yeah. look, there's just there's a handful of guys. We mentioned Xavier Thomas, B.J. Ojolari, definitely up there that you're just eager to see in pads in camp. You know, when Nick Rawls says in Arizona Sports that Drew Petzing walked up to him early in the off season and said, "Man, I can see that B.J. Ojolari has taken a step already, just in a couple of practices, just in the run game, setting violent edges, playing low, using his length, getting separation." hitting the ball, winning his rushes, and how excited they all are about B.J. Ojolari, especially at such a position of need. Uh, again, you are you took the dude in the second round. I mean, you, High second round. You need to have him hit pretty hard yeah. at some point. Yeah. And by the way, when B.J. Ojolari was asked, realistically, could he see himself <laughs> as a double-digit sack guy, he immediately answered, most definitely. So It was funny, though. When I was talking to him a couple weeks ago for my story, I asked him about the sacks, and he said at the time, look, he goes, I know sacks are what get you paid and what you get, get you adulation, but I want to also be that guy that can drop into coverage and be that guy that can do everything so that defenses don't know exactly what I'm going to do. So it'll be interesting to see not only how they're using him, um, but how he's able to perform in some of those areas. Yeah, I thought that question was interesting, and it's not necessarily a knock on – you know, who was asking the question or what the yeah. intention was. But, like, what, what do you expect him to say? No, I don't really know that I can do that. Like, let's temper the expectations. Yeah, you know, like, I, I, I take the response that you got in, in that explanation and the whole context of that personally I'm, a little more to heart. I'm going to – and and if he ever hears this, <laughs> I, I hope he knows that I'm saying this in uh, – just to tell a story, but once – once upon a time, a reporter asked Chandler Jones, do you think you get 20 sacks in a season? And, of course, Chandler said, yeah, I can get 20 sacks in a season. And then the story was Chandler Jones is thinks he can get 20 sacks a season. And I'm like, okay. like, Right. Yeah, like he's calling his shot. I, I just remember Chandler's rant when he got 17 sacks, and then everyone, and then he got 19 sacks. And then uh, I think then the question was, can you get 20? And so it was just this never-ending you know, the media always wants more. And, you know, can't you guys just appreciate the 17 or 19 sack season? So, exactly. Uh, but, it's like asking Danny yeah. if she could get gold in breakdancing. Of course she's going to say yes. I just keep coming back, though, to the fortified defensive line. And when Justin Jones makes comments about the first round rookie, Darius Robinson, the first round rookie not named Marvin Harrison Jr who apparently has been very impressive in the meeting rooms. Forget about the physicality. Or you can't really tell because they don't have full pads on yet. But when he has the mind to play the NFL, according to Justin Jones, that tells me, all right, kid has a chance to make an impact because the first thing you have to do is earn the trust of your coaches, and they're not going to play you unless you earn the trust, and you're not going to be a mental error or bust waiting to happen. So that's intriguing. Justin Jones, Bilal Nichols, and then a rotation with Dante Stills, who also has been very impressive in the offseason by all accounts. Got a mention from Jonathan Gannon, who uh, just unbeknownst to anyone, he just brought it up on his own as Dante Stills, and then uh, Darius Robinson. And we know how good Roy Lopez was, just, you know, in, in a limited role, he was effective. So 
if there's one area about this team that I feel a lot better about than last year, it would have to be defensive line. That's the expectation with the first round pick. Obviously, it's going to happen where when you're the second first round pick, right, everyone's going to want to talk about Marvin Harrison Jr. first. The expectations are still there for Darius Robinson. Similar in the sense that that is a room where there is a spot for him to really carve a role for himself. Darren has him starting. Uh, You remember that tweet Darren put out there? That's right. My next point was, though, I I can see a world where he doesn't start. And that's not to say that he wouldn't be grasping the scheme or the playbook or what is expected of him. But think about the veterans in that room, Justin Jones and Bilal Nichols, who were brought in, re-signing LJ Collier. I could see Robinson being more of that rotational player, which is what we're going to see anyway, and really having a presence maybe on third down and kind of getting his feet wet throughout the season and and really starting to have a bigger presence the further we get into the season. When we were watching practice, I don't even, I can't even tell you the day that, Monday? Last Monday? One Was of that those only days. Yes, this week? Yesterday? We're watching practice and we're standing in one of the parts that is shaded in our area, which is, I mean, inches from where the D line splits off and, and does their work. And it felt different. Not a knock of the previous group of D linemen who were here. I mean, they f- it feels yes. mean and it feels gritty and it feels intimidating and that's what you want out of a d-line and then you've got justin jones the veteran newly acquired a cardinal sit down and talk to the media and it's like oh yeah like you can feel the vibe that he is bringing and that Bilal nichols is bringing and how that is trickling down to the rest of that group and that they really are bringing out the best in each other i'd ask that because every time they they split up into pairs to do something Jones and Nichols are always yeah. together and you can hear them encourage each other and hype each other up and talk about what they need to be better and, and tell them, oh, like that was great. Like how what, whatever it is they're working on, like they are always encouraging each other. And then you can see that spread amongst the group. It was Ben Stilley who was going and coaching up Darius Robinson when we were watching practice and Dante Stills was being vocal in what he was seeing. It feels mean and it feel in a good way of what we're seeing from this new defensive line group. I, I don't I don't think, it, and it kind of goes back to, because I was standing around Danny when you're, you're looking at him, and just when you, when you see that group, and I was talking to somebody on uh, the football side, and that person was marveling just how, and again, no disrespect, but how much better that group is than it was. And, and again, it's not like Aaron Donald standing out there but but it's not the practice squad players you saw the last no, two games of I mean, last year. They have really, really improved that group. And again, I, I, I'm not sitting here saying they're going to be the 2,000 Ravens and shut every team down, but that changes so much of the equation as you go forward. I, I, I will say that if some of these rookies come through in the secondary, the strides that this defense could make in one season could be pretty impressive. Yeah, a couple of things. One, to your point about media has close proximity to the D-line drills. If only we could go hard knocks and get some mics and cameras out there and bring you the chatter. Just just bring you bring you the chatter, which we can't report on exactly, although I will share this. Uh, there was one player who set a pretty violent edge, and somebody piped up, well, when you have a neck tattoo like that, you better set a violent edge. So there's just a lot of great back and forth. About Miles Murphy. I think I, think I looked, <laughs> yes. I turned to Zach Gershman, and I said, and this is the moment I learned that Miles Murphy has a neck tattoo. Uh-huh. And so it's just, and you know what? This is this is about as unscientific as it gets. But when you see a position group, and especially a group that's been together, what, three weeks? When you've added the veterans with the rookies in the D-line room, they'd been together three weeks. And everybody is giving everyone else the business and the chatter. You realize, okay, there's instant chemistry there. And, uh, you know, there are position groups you've seen in the past where nobody's saying anything you know, throughout an entirety of a drill. And I just, it sounds cheesy and I get it. It's NFL and it's professional football, but when they're having a good time, that usually means you're going to have a good team because they know they're good and they're, it's more than a job. They're enjoying it. So we'll see. That can mean absolutely nothing, but based on last year, it's obviously a huge area of improvement. And that camaraderie is important. I mean, Justin Jones talked about that when asked about his leadership that he was 
you know, really providing from the get go of, of coming here. And Jones had said, look, I can't show up here and start acting like their dad. Like they're also my peers. You have to be nice to people. You have to genuinely be nice to people and want the others around you to be their best because that is going to allow everybody to be their best. Paul, we had a chance to talk with cornerback Garrett Williams going into his second year on the Big Red Rage a week ago, and he talked about the camaraderie between the defense as a whole and the Russian coverage being a marriage and how that is an important aspect as well. It's not just the D-line building camaraderie, right? But the whole defense together and, and building that chemistry and that trust because there's a lot of turnover on the defensive side of the ball. And so it's it's not just the D-line that's having to adjust to all of that. It's it's the defense as a whole. It's I find it very interesting that you made that point about how Justin Jones was saying, like, I can't treat him like their father. And, and everybody's got to kind of have that symbiotic relationship because Buddha said the same thing. Uh, Buddha was a little more pointed. And when he said there's not the egos aren't there and we can all I as a leader, as an as a veteran, I can give I can teach people and they're accepting of it. And more important, and, and just as important, Buddha said, I have to be willing to accept that same kind of stuff from people. But it does make you think a little bit. I'm like, okay, were, was there somebody before that Buddha was trying to teach that wasn't accepting of the, of the teaching? That's not good. Not from Buddha Baker. Yeah, I've been trying to run names through my head who we could be talking about. But he definitely had someone in mind. Sure when, sounded like it. When he brought that up. But but it goes back to what, what yeah. Danny was just saying about Justin Jones. It feels like when Buddha says there's this college atmosphere and then talking about the camaraderie it's it there's whatever they've created and it doesn't necessarily mean they win a bunch of football games they still got to prove that but whatever they have created seems it's it's hard to hide that feel you can sit there and say everything's fine but you kind of get a vibe one way or the other you definitely get the vibe as they say these things that it's genuine and look it's impossible in the nfl to have a good team if you have a bad d-line just is. You, you, show me an example of a good team with a bad D line. You know, Justin Jefferson just got paid. Now the highest paid non quarterback in the league, correct? And I saw, you know, the rankings of the diff- different position groups in terms of the salary structure. Quarterback's number one, receiver's not all the way up to number three, and D line is number two. Edge and defensive tackles, premier. So it just denotes the importance of that. And that's probably where the Cardinals were most deficient a year ago, both because of injury. I mean, horrendous injury. There was no position room more injured than defensive line. But then they also needed to add talent. So if they've indeed done that, we are talking about this with Rob Fredrickson about Buda Baker. So Buda laments the fact that he doesn't get any action anymore, right? Nobody comes his way and teams go out there and they go the other way in a way. But wait a minute. Now, if you've fortified the front seven, maybe Buda does not need to put the safety into safety position doesn't have to be the safety valve all the time and you really can get creative and utilize him as a playmaker a Troy Polamalu type and move him around a defense and he could be much more of a playmaker difference maker than perhaps having to stay home and save chunk run after potential touchdown run which he had to do a year ago side note Standing there at practice Monday, I mean, this is gearing towards the end of off-season workouts with the exception of one more OTA and then mini camp next week. And it was it was a little warm. I mean, it was definitely the warmest practice on Monday. And um, I think you could tell that the D-line was just trying to have a little fun with it. And what was so funny to watch was defensive line coach Derek LeBon is in a – an electric car, no yep. car, uh, yep. scooter, yeah. sitting cool. down yeah. a scooter because he, he playing with his grandkids. He tore his quad and his Achilles, so he's had surgery. He he is a trooper because I will say, three weeks ago when he was first out there, he was in like an equipment cart driving around, and then the next week he was in a golf cart, so he had some shade. And now they've got him in one of these scooters, and he is whipping around. And the D line was having a field day with their coach talking about how he needed a horn or to get him a flag to put on the back. And Dante (laughs) Stills is singing, they see me roll it. Like they are just, I was sitting there and I was like, you know what? If I had to be a fly on the wall in any of these position rooms, it would probably be D-line right now. Uh, At what point are we going to start talking about the 
Cardinals coaching staff is being injury prone. <laughs> well, quarterbacks coach Izzy Wolf worked tore his Achilles. Yep. We saw him at the combine. He was on a <laughs> his knee was on one wow. of those scooters. Yeah, yeah. I mean they've they got to be careful. And and JG has mentioned multiple times how he can't run anymore because of his football injuries for right. once upon a time. So that might be in their future contracts, yeah. like the players. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we had Kerry Rhodes on a couple of times over the last couple of years. Remember, they were teammates at Louisville. And Kerry said more than once, Jonathan Gannon would have been an NFL safety. That the tragic hip injury he suffered early in his college career, uh, you know, he was tracking. So Kerry said he was my backup. I was the older guy. He was behind me. He was the young guy. But he said, I, I saw enough talent. So, okay. Um, here's my question. Just overall on this defense, do you see them making one of those pre-camp signings? Are they going to be able to tell enough? What have you guys seen? What do you surmise? Will there be someone added the first week of camp, late July, August, to bolster this team? I'm presuming on defense, but perhaps anywhere. Talking like a, a big name, right? All right, I'll say it. How about a veteran corner? You guys know I've been pounding the podium for a veteran yeah. corner. That that would probably be the position that at this point in the offseason – would make the most sense when you're looking at the veterans that are in that room and that it's really Sean Murphy bunting and then a lot of youth. Um, you've got some second year players, but but to have a, a true veteran because I, I it doesn't seem like they're really gonna move Garrett Williams outside. No, it seems like he's going to stay put where he is unless you are in some sort of pickle and and that's your best option is to move him outside so if we're talking about defense cornerback would make the most sense if they are going to bring in a veteran I don't know that they are yeah they they might start waiting for those until transactions start happening and cuts are happening around the league and and players are available I don't I really don't know that they're going to spend money at this point to bring in a veteran cornerback I just think you have so many young guys that are going to be in that vein, whether it's slot or outside, with Melton and Jones and Rabbit and Williams, like I and just feel, I feel like all you're doing is stunting growth. Starling Thomas, Keith Starling Thomas, Clark. yeah, Starling. Again, you have so many people. Also, big extra stars for Danny for using pickle, which we you, I just don't hear that much anymore. In that vein, I mean, obviously, if you go get a pickle with your lunch, that's different. But you're welcome, I guess. Well, look, if you uh, if Sean Murphy Bunting is at one corner and Garrett Williams is your nickel slot corner, then OK, here it goes. Max Melton against Elijah Jones against Keytrell Clark, who am I forgetting? Starling in- Thomas. Starling Thomas. Yes. That, so there you so go. When when you say you want to sign, have them sign a, a veteran corner, and what's the thought process? Oh, I love this because he's trying to he's trying to throw Trip you under up. the bus or get something out of the ball. I'm trying to throw him under the bus. Proven. I'm, I'm going to have a, get, a yeah, good debate. Yeah, well, let's okay. hear it. So my answer would be twofold. Just in general, big picture, proven versus unproven. At okay. least you would have one proven corner. And then number two. Besides Sean Murphy, buddy. Or you don't Yeah, in him. addition to Sean okay, Murphy. Yeah, okay. In addition. In addition. I'm talking about that Other corner, corner, the outside yeah, yeah, yeah. corner opposite SMB, as the uh, players call them. And then the other situation, honestly, is um, you don't have a repeat of last year. Where you start with a rookie, he struggles, you got to make a move. And you're sort of chasing that position all year long. I also wonder, to counter that argument of the new coaching staff, the new front office, and and the position they were put in with the draft and all the needs they had. I mean, when you're looking at who you had, they might have thought they had the pieces they needed. Or it wasn't as high on the list of priorities of things that absolutely needed to be overturned and and have a new group of players come in as immediately as some other positions. But I think the fact that they drafted three cornerbacks and you bring in Sean Murphy bunting and, and it just, it seems like this is a position where they really want to grow their own players. It feels like, I mean, how many times have we heard Gannon talk about farm to table, Paul? Yes. How important (laughs) these game reps are. And (laughs) DBs are his bread and butter. So that's a great point. That's a great point. Bread and butter, pickles. Well, not just, I I ate lunch. I don't know why. What are these? I think the fact you, you saying JG, I think that's the great point is that JG's that guy. Yes. And I just, it, it feels like this is one of those positions where they really want to have like homegrown players. Yeah. 
Well, on paper, I mean, uh, they definitely have more in terms of assets at corner. Not only is Sean Murphy bunting, but they have a high second-round pick in Max Melton. Remember last year, Keetra Clark was a six-round pick. Correct. And then Elijah Jones, who was picked number 90 overall, late third-round pick. I didn't realize, and he's our guest this week in the Big Red Rage, he played in 64 games at Boston College. That's an all-time Boston College record. He's 24, going to be 25 during the season. So Elijah Jones is far from just some sort of newbie out of college. I mean, if there's anyone equipped to maybe make that transition, Max Melton was a four-year starter at Rutgers, at least three years. So see, there's and, a lot of experience yes. there. And, and again, that goes back to what you were saying before about the intrigue of Xavier Thomas. Um, because Xavier Thomas, he's also going to turn 25 at the end of the season. He actually thinks his age worked against him and one of the reasons he dropped to the fifth round. But again, now he missed some games because of the injuries and all this stuff. But he's been around a while. They've ex- He's experienced a lot. You mentioned Max, Max Melton. But sticking with the cornerbacks, like, I just feel like if you're going to spend second and third round picks on those kinds of guys, you you got to be seriously thinking about using them. I mean, I understand the last year problem. I really do. I also understand Keith Charles Clark was a six round pick. And Starling Thomas, you, you picked off the waiver wire. Not that that's bad. I think the Lions would have kept Starling Thomas on, his pract- on the practice squad if they could have. Um, Especially since they went after two round one corners this yes. year, or round one and round two, two very highly drafted guys. But but I'm I'm with Danny in the fact it does feel like they that's a position they'd really like to hold, and maybe it goes back to because JG has that background, maybe he thinks this is the one place where we really can get really awesome rookie development because. We have the experience on this coaching staff to make sure it happens. Paul, I know you had Elijah Jones as your Big Red Rage guest this week. I know you talked about music. How many of the artists that he was oh, talking Because I haven't listened. How many of the artists that he was talking about had you heard of? I'd say uh, 11.3% of the artists he named. I, I could He's actually, already narrowed down the I, time. I, I really, yeah. It was, um, I just sort of nodded. Okay. And he smiled because he knew I, I had no clue. And then afterwards, <laughs> I said, "That's all right, you know. It's uh, I, I let you flex your music knowledge, which went way beyond mine. I did throw out a couple of jazz artists though that I grew up listening to via my old man, you know, Chet Baker on horn, uh, you know, Ramsey Lewis on uh, piano, jazz piano. Shout out Bertrand Berry. He loves Ramsey Lewis. He plays the piano himself. So, you know, I still listen to Miles Davis every Sunday. It's a ritual based on growing up because my dad played uh, trumpet in college and was a jazz trumpet guy. So, uh, yeah, so we connected a little bit. That's that's the 11.3 percent I cited. Didn't connect as much as you and Zabin with your cars and all (laughs) that, though. Okay. No. Okay. All right. Here's here's a a quick off topic podcast question because you just made me think of it. More off topic than breakdancing? Well, (laughs) kind of. Smart bandages? Um. (laughs) <laughs> okay, you guys are making good points. Um, I'm in a pickle here. Um, I will. I will. I want to ask because I remember when I was like, I, random. My my dad. I remember my dad. Coming I think you're embarrassing yourself with the question. I, I think I am. You're trying to embarrass us, but I, you're... I was like 16 years old. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm okay, trying to right. find out what what if this ever came up because you made me think of it. I remember once when I was like 16 years old, my dad comes up to me and I'm like randomly, we weren't even having that long of a conversation. He looked at me and he was being mostly serious. And he goes, I just want you to know, you better not ever call me your old man ever. (laughs) And you just had mentioned that I I listen to my old man. I think my dad would probably feel the same way if I had to guess. Yeah. I I just, that's that's what made me. Well, you know what? My dad's now 80 plus. So deal with it. Okay. All right, Lou, deal with it. Um, So. Here's the question I was going to throw out there because it's a question. Sorry, we, I didn't mean to derail us. It's a question we've been putting to the big red rage guests. Do you remember, Danny, when we asked Garrett Williams, okay, if you want to know about offensive weapons, ask a defensive guy who has caught your eye out there, not named Marvin Harrison Jr. Do you remember the two players he named? Greg Dortch and I know this. Oh, Michael <coughs> Wilson. Yes, yes, indeed, Michael Wilson. He said people are sleeping on Michael Wilson. And so, okay, very interesting. But he did enthusiastically start with Dorch. And then I put the same question to Elijah Jones this week. Not that you don't need to listen to the Big Red Rage because there's 14 other minutes of compelling content. But when I asked him the same question, Elijah Jones jumped on it and said, Trey McBride. 
one athletic catch after another by Trey McBride, is what Elijah Jones said. Now he's a rookie in the NFL, and what has he seen, right? He's new on this. But he uh, he said, yeah, 85 has caught his eye, no doubt. So I, I, The Dorch thing is interesting because I've been going back and forth on that. At first I wasn't sure exactly what kind of role he might have or whether he would fit in. And it, I, it just it feels like more and more like when you – when you hear Gannon talk about him, when you see some of the stats floating around, I saw some analytical chart that basically said out of all the players in the NFL who showed best against man coverage in terms of, I think it was yards over uh, expected or something like that, Greg Dortch blew everybody out of the water. I Come on. S- I say really? that yes. And I'm not trying to... I, I'm a big fan of Greg Dorch. I sit here and I, and I don't know what went into the analytics of that, of yeah. snap count or, you know, how many passes they were catching or anything like that. I wonder, I mean, Dorch didn't have a, a massive role last year. No. So is that skewed from the Chicago game it, it, to a certain that, well, extent? Possible, possible. And okay. I'm, I'm not trying to downplay what he You're adds to this team. You're just asking the question, Danny. Right. And, and I think it's important to to look at those and have those questions when you're seeing – Fair. graphics and stats like that it is interesting right are we going to see Dorch in a role that was envisioned for Rondell Moore that for whatever reason did not pan out I it, I, I really don't know yet what that's going to be for him so NFL.com this week came out with yet another list it's oh, list you love season. those Paul this is probably the only list, I, about lists. I haven't had an issue with oh one underappreciated player from every team is the category. And I'll I'll just start by, I'll set the table with the division. For the Rams, it's receiver Demarcus Robinson. For the Niners, receiver Juwan Jennings, who, by the way, just got paid two years, ten and a half million. Seattle went, uh, their pick was outside linebacker Boye Mafe, nine sacks, had one against the Cardinals last year. For the Cardinals, Greg Dortch. Whoa. And here was a stat I was not aware of. That from weeks 11 to 18, he was the second most targeted player on the Cardinals offense. From week 11 to 18, he also racked up the second most receiving first downs, 14. Wow. Of any player on the Cardinals, the second half of last season, basically with Kyler Murray. I gotta be. I saw that too. Um, I will. I'll be honest. Like I, I, again, it's it's all preference or whatever. And with all due respect to Greg Dorch, I. If I think of the most underappreciated player on the Cardinals, I am think I'm still going with Jalen Thompson. I mean, there's a, this is a guy who, now, he got paid, so he's appreciated in that regard. But, I mean, I, I think, heck, at this point, with the amount of people that have talked about Greg Dortch nationally here and there, there's probably more people that know about Greg Dortch than Jalen Thompson. And, by the way, speaking of contracts, Greg Dortch signed that one-year exclusive rights Tender offer. He's making nine eighty five. Not even making a million. So um, he's got a lot on the line. Talk about guys in prove it years. Greg Dorch is one of those guys. A lot yeah, of guys I, on I, I think years. that Dorch. He is a name consistently. We talk about every training camp, and then it, it kind of seems like he has never really climbed the depth chart high enough to have a major role on offense consistently throughout the season. It seems like he has the physical traits. It makes me makes me wonder. Is something that the hurdle he's trying to get over, maybe mastering the playbook or blocking or something along those lines. And so you hope, I mean, the fact that from what we've seen in practice, he's, I mean, I practice is used lightly from what we've seen in the offseason. He's looked good. And so you'd hope that whatever it is physically, mentally that he's being challenged <laughs> with, that he's, you know, rising to the occasion and can really carve out a role in the offense. Or look, every single decision maker putting together an NFL roster just looks at his stature and says, that's a guy we got to replace. And if you're going to have weapons that are going to command the attention of the defense and Marvin Harrison Jr. and Michael Wilson and Trey McBride and James Conner, great. If, if Greg Dorch is yeah. going to consistently be yeah. open and, and be able to get you those extra yards or some first downs, who cares who it is, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> more what, power what, to you. And especially Dorch, who's a very adept return man, get him the ball in space right. and get out of the way. So to your point, like all these other guys are commanding attention from the defense. If he's able to carve a little bit of room somewhere, we saw what happened against Chicago. He got it in space underneath, 
he gone. Yeah. You know, it makes a bunch of guys look stupid as if it's a punt return, and he's waltzing into the end zone. The other thing about Greg Dortch, which you know, I hope maybe gets traction this year, is my saying about Greg Dortch. I've been saying this for a couple of years now. When you exist on the edge of the roster, you play with an edge, and that's Dortch to me. He's the same dude in a dog day camp practice in mid-August that he is in December. He's the same guy. So when he gets his chance, you know, he, he, it's funny because a few times he's been our post-game radio guest, and he always looks at me like, yeah, well, you know, this is me. Like, why are you asking me these questions? Why are people surprised? This is the way I compete every single practice. So when his number is called and he gets that one scan opportunity where you better take opportunity or you won't get another – He's ready because that's the way he always plays. It's always interesting when you run across those guys, and there's a lot of them. The ones that, uh, well, for lack of a better term, uh, very much expect to do well in the very few chances they get and act really <laughs> miffed if you would think of anything Chip else. Chip on the shoulder. At Yellow, do, 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 so much. Do you know who the boulder? Do you know who the rookie is who fits that mindset? And that type that you're describing? I think I have it in my head. Rabbit. Yep, that's what I was guessing. <laughs> remember what? Remember his story about when they switched him? They wanted to switch him from offense to defense in college. He's like, have you seen my tape? Yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> right, he's, which was a great story. He's that guy now. I, he really is. He's that just the bravado, brimming with uber confidence. Um, so I'm I'm curious. I'm really curious to see if he's able to cover roll because he's got a tough – I mean, he's got Jalen Thompson and Buda Baker ahead of him. That ain't happening. And then Garrett Williams. So what is his role? Where would he play? Is he going to be like a Buda Baker – I'm sorry. Yeah, like a Buda Baker who his rookie year is blocked by a Tyron Matthew, but you know he has star potential. So, oh, I don't know. He just goes to the Pro Bowl as a rookie on special teams. Yeah, that was the Buda story as a rookie. So, which, by the way, you know, Buddha shuns the uh, special teams now, right? In the press conference, they asked him about the new kickoff. Maybe it was you, Danny. I don't know. And then he's like, oh, that's somebody else's problem. He was saying he's going to be excited on the sideline, ready right. to put his helmet out yeah. and run well, out let, there. Let's make this very clear. But he made a point. Buddha, he yes. made a point that it's beneath well, me. <laughs> because I don't. I think the question was, you know, how, and I think there was a part of him less that it was beneath him, but more like felt a little sheepishly like, well, I'm not going to talk about like, how hard or how cool it might be because I'm not in the middle of it. That's kind That's of a what jerk I took move. From it, yeah. yeah. Okay. I just I, I you well, know. Well, so first of all, we all know that Paul likes to throw Buddha under the bus. We saw that in Minnesota <laughs> last year, <laughs> no. and it just continues. No. no, there's nothing good to be gained by me being on the wrong side of a perennial Pro Bowl or Buddha Baker. Please don't start that narrative. Although I I think think yeah I did lose some credibility in the Buddha Baker uh, you know side what of the is locker room my because mind? of that That's, um, in Minnesota. I think there was a comment about yeah. lifting weights. He misunderstood my question where I meant you were picking up two dumbbells that oh, were 110 yes. each combined as 220. He thought I meant like he didn't weigh as much as one dumbbell, <laughs> which was 110. Wasn't this during um, when come we were on. out there for joint practices? Yes, yes. Come yes. On. I was thinking yes. 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 It was. I was overheated. It was hot. People, I was overheated. People were, oh, that was hot. The synapses hey, weren't Speaking firing. of, at least uh, it shouldn't hopefully be as hot for joint practices this year because yeah, JG said practices with the Colts and Indy will be at night. Okay, so he did say that, and he did say they're under the lights, but as uh, Rob Fredrickson pointed out on the Red Sea Report, <laughs> And in that part of the country, that time of year, it true. doesn't even get dark till like eight thirty nine. Yeah, that's true. Having I, having spent many a summer in Michigan with my family, I, I, that, I that's one of the parts I love because you're out there playing t uh, touch football with other kids in the neighborhood, <laughs> and it's like nine thirty, and you're still playing because it's light outside. So it's not going to be broiling hot, but woohoo! But I don't know if the lights will be on necessarily. It's just a figure of speech, yes. Paul. Yes, I know. Um, but there will be extra electricity. There's no doubt. Those 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 evening practices, Darren. Come on now. It just brings that little extra. Like I think it takes the players back to like their high school football days. Yeah, I can kind of see that. So we'll see. There'll be there'll be you know I don't what what's the over under right now on um, you know I'm not gonna say melee, but uh, you know incidents. You know a little kerfuffle. You know something breaking out. I'll say two and a half. Two and a half on the over under mm. on. Uh, 
I thought JG, JG yeah, he not like let he runs that happen. a tight ship. Mm. <laughs> you don't trust that? I'll you, say under two and a half. I'll say it, under. Nothing, nothing happened in, no, nah, I would say under two. Nothing happened in Minnesota, did it? Did mm-hmm. it? Anything? No. The, 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 it was close. Isaiah, I mean, Isaiah Simmons, Isaiah Simmons had some. Uh, he was, Charles Clark did it. He had some late did contact. The did the gritty. Yeah, the grit. It didn't go well for him like three reps later when Justin Jefferson got him. But Well, it also didn't go well for him because that's pretty much not what these coaches want yeah, from their players that's, either. No, but. that is true. So, um, so okay. Um, so there's that. What other news this week? Anything else? Uh, the whole veteran thing. Uh, now, Darren, you, you threw out there, if you were a player, a ring or gold Oh, yeah, this, was, this was in the mailbag. Okay. The, the person wanted to know if I had asked a bunch of players this, which I never really have because I have reasons for not thinking that it makes sense. But I'm curious here, if you had a, if you were some big star NFL player, would you rather have a ring or a gold jacket? Gold jacket. Somehow that does not surprise me. <laughs> That's not so serving Can I explain my answer? Go right ahead. Because the gold jacket is something you control. You can be... True a gold jacket player on an abysmal team and or franchise and your career would go in anonymity. So if you had to choose one or the other, I would go with gold jacket because you are controlling the controllable. Well, but you are contr- you're controlling your choice. If I say you get a ring instead of a gold jacket, you're guaranteeing you're getting a ring. Now, I don't know what kind of role you're going to have. I, w- I would go with Paul. I'd have the same answer. I think because... I think that actually shows how great of a, you know, you can make both arguments of someone like Tom Brady, look at all his Super Bowls. Okay, that proves he was a great player. There are also lots of great players and the fact that you never won a Super Bowl and you were still so great that you are recognized by your peers, I think says a lot as well. I mean, I just, look, I was never good enough to make any kind of significant teams once upon a time, but the teams that I have gotten on to play on and, and the ones that, uh, I've been part of. There's just something about that. I mean, for instance, let's take this team Super Bowl run. I am obviously not a player. I'm not even working on the football side of things. But I will tell you that that month running it up to the Super Bowl and they didn't even win that game was, uh, aside from my wedding and the birth of my children, that was the most amazing time in my life. And to be able to just live through that is just, crazy and and I just feel like if you're if you end up doing the gold jacket obviously you're going to have a lot of great memories and you're going to be a great player but but you won't necessarily have gone that through now if you have a gold jacket you're probably guaranteeing yourself making a lot of money probably have some fame that you're not necessarily guaranteeing otherwise but but also it's a discussion every time when it comes to the hall of fame inductees not when they're nominated of well this player didn't win a super bowl Right? Does that yeah. does that taint the reputation or how deserving they are? It, it's it it's shouldn't a hard, taint it, but it, right, it is right? part it's, of it. It's a discussion. Yeah. It it's it's that's a really tough question, yeah. right? The whole point is to win, right? That's what everyone they're spending every single day of the year working towards. Well, that year the Cardinals had a Hall of Famer in Kurt Warner, who led the team to Super Bowl forty three. You need that guy at that position. Did you hear what Jonathan Gannon with Wolf and Luke on Arizona Sports said about Kyla Murray? And I quote, that's this week, by the way, it's kind of eye-popping the kind of command that he has on the practice field. The defense knows they better be ready to roll or they will get diced. And then he wanted to say, I love the versatility to play multiple ways on offense with a Kyla Murray as our quarterback. So the praise keeps coming in from the head coach on the quarterback, his first off season spent with Kyler, obviously. And so um, that's not the first time that he's used the phrase eye popping or really, uh, you know, just bringing a new sort of awareness to his ability to excel as a quarterback. So, okay. Um, you know, once again, just more intrigue as to what Kyler's going to look like this season in this offense. Now that he can command the offense, he has a familiarity, he has a run game. You know James Conner, and who looks about as motivated as as possible, and so um, yeah, it's just uh, you know if the game is going to begin and end with your quarterback, then I think the Cardinals, at least based on JG, I'm just reading through the coach, uh, he seems really bullish on his quarterback right now. Well, God, I hope so. 
because otherwise, no bueno. But uh, yeah, I mean, but I mean, don't you don't you get a sense that look, you're never going to be negative or critical of your quarterback in the press, but. Some of the praise, yeah, no, I I would agree. Goes with that. above and beyond. It goes back to what I was talking about earlier in the in the podcast when I was saying how you can say all the right things, but you can tell when it's genuine. I would agree with that. I, I don't think there's any question that what JG says, the nice things he says about Kyler Murray, the encouraging things he says about Kyler Murray, he absolutely in his gut believes them. But again. There's has to be the performance, and that's that's just where we are. And that's not a knock on Kyler. It's not a knock on anybody. It's not a knock on, you know. It's it's not going to be. I mean, it seems like at this point, the future. For instance, just making for instance here, but the in, the futures of of Buda Baker or James Conner with this team hinge a lot on what happens this year. And I I same thing with not necessarily a future with Kyler Murray, but like. Kyler's now going to have the whole offseason. We're going to talk all offseason about how he's got this whole offseason. He's going to be healthy. All these things. Like, there's no, there can be no stumbling blocks anymore. This, this has to be, this has to be a, I'm not going to necessarily say it has to be a great season for Kyler Murray, but it better be pretty damn close. That's an interesting point we haven't really talked about when discussing prove it years. It might not be a prove it year in terms of he's in a contract year. I think you could argue, though, that this might be a prove-it year. Year two, first full offseason with this staff and the changes he made when he came back in the middle of last season, all of the qualities they want to see from him on the field, the qualities they want to see from him off the field, and and leading this team to success. I think that's a really good point of we should have high expectations. I mean, Kyler's not a rookie. He's not going into year two, year three. That's the other thing. He's going into year six, too. Yeah. He's got a top five run game. They solidified the offensive line. Gave him weapons out wide. Yeah. So it's all right there. They're <laughs> you know beefing up the defense, so you're not having to sling it and be one dimensional playing from behind. Once again, everybody now. Last time he had a top ten run game was the first half of 2021, and they started seven and zero, ten and two. So we'll see what that means. All I know you is you had to bring up seven and one, didn't you? You yeah. couldn't say seven and zero. You had to bring up AJ Green not turning around. No, no. What did I say? I said seven and zero, oh, ten and two. That, oh, is that what you said? That's, that's what I, was I heard. Seven 10 and, and one. Okay. By the way, not, uh, I feel like an idiot now. Maybe I mixed it because I was going to talk about week one and getting back to the Colts. I'll leave you with this. Have you seen the smoke between CJ Stroud and the Colts oh, yeah. defense? Oh no, not the Colts. I saw I saw CJ Stroud said some interesting things about Aaron Rodgers, but I did not and hear Matthew about Stafford? the Colts. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. About if, like, Matthew Stafford had essentially been in Green Bay, he would have had as many rings as Aaron Rodgers? He's that good of a No, no, right? as Tom Brady. As Tom Brady. Yeah, he was saying, like, if Matthew Stafford had played for all those Green Bay teams, he would have won way more rings. Really? Oh, yeah, he... C.J. Stroud said that. Oh, yes. yeah. Wow. Look it up. Okay. So is this as well, good with a coach young, defense? The young man needs his uh, own podcast uh, at this point. So, he does need his own podcast. Seeing some of the stuff he's yeah. done with Micah Parsons is hilarious. So apparently uh, the Colts linebackers, Zaire Franklin and EJ Speed, they uh, tossed some shade at C.J. Stroud Whoops. and said, uh, you know, we need to see that guy again. Uh, I'm going to mess him up for the rest of his career. Whoa. What? What okay. were they saying this on? This was unprompted? It was earlier this offseason. And um, so then Stroud was asked about it on a podcast that dropped this week. And he talked about, yeah, you know, I heard it. They're going to hit CJ. You know, they're going to hit me in my face. I'm going to get him next year and all this. He said, where I'm from, this is CJ Stroud now, where I'm from, we say, why didn't you do something when you were mad? You were mad right there. Do something. You could have made hella plays, bro. You could have made plays, dog. You could have made me shut up right there, but you didn't. So it makes you think you're going to do it now. And if you do, I'm going to come back for real and uh, blah, 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 all this stuff. So anyway, I know he's quoting, but it's just there's something so awesome about I know, Paul I want to make sure I didn't make dog, any so that they have bro. clean cuts for no. future intros. No, that's I, I already I wrote that into <laughs> my, new, my new contract. No drops for me. Uh, so anyway, and then he finished by saying, you know what? The Colts hate me already, and I love it. And they square off in week one. So Great. God, that, some that good rivalries. Fantastic. There you go. So if you run out of questions when you're in Indy for the joint practices, start asking about C.J. Stroud. You'll, you'll, get, you'll get some reaction there, apparently, from the Colts defense. That's why I throw that out there. 
I think there's still some yeah. Cardinals fans pretty salty about C.J. Stroud, too. All right, so Darren made it through with his throat and all. You don't need any smart bandages for your throat, by chance. You, I, I will Darren? say this. Right? Yesterday I was really struggling, and my wife's like, what did you take yesterday? And I said, well, I didn't take anything. And I got to look like, what the F are you doing? <laughs> Why are you not taking anything? Which I don't really love taking medicine, but it's amazing when you take some medicine, how much that can help you get mm. through the day. Crazy. Wow. So you're finding out why medicine exists. Is that what it's a, sort well, of an epiphany for you? You okay. like to think, oh, I'm all right. Yeah. It's not, you know. You know, Darren's the old school tough guy. I can rub some dirt on it. You know, here I go. You well, know, I'll make my, it through. Uh, last, quite, well, last quick thing. You talk about the rubbing the dirt on it. This is <laughs> my youngest son loves this story. When he, he was playing baseball when he was, uh, I don't know, at, at this point he was, I think he was seven or eight. And he was on a pretty good team, and he was out throwing the ball, and he and he jammed his finger or something, and he was crying about it. And I'm like, "Dude, shake it off. You're fine. Go play." And he played, and but it was bothering him. Like two days later, my wife took him to the emergency room, and he broke it. <laughs> and oh, sorry. To this sorry. very day, yeah. Yeah. to this very day, he still is like, "Hey, Dad, remember the time I broke my finger, and you told me just to play with it." Like, rub some dirt on it and go on. I'm like, yes, I remember. It makes you feel better. I feel like every kid has a story like that. Two summers ago. Because we don't trust all our kids. Yeah. Two summers ago, my 12-year-old daughter was complaining and complaining. We were on vacation. My wife uh, had to go back for work. So it was me and the two kids. And, of course, she deemed me unequipped and unqualified to handle the kids. And I said, nah, she's fine. Don't worry about it. As soon as we got back to the AZ, the next day, my wife took her to the doctor. She had a double ear infection and pink eye. <clears throat> Do you think I've ever heard the end of that? No. Absolutely not. And but, you never will. But that's the end of this edition of Cardinals Underground, brought to you by Pacific Office Automation.